so we met with heart failure leadership. We've been working with these folks for a number of months. And they said, we want to drive attention to cost of care. Uh, so we have here, uh, we're looking at heart failure docs. We, we pulled up Sharon Mulvey. She's a cardiologist here. And she logged in for the first time. And we pulled up length of stay. And she was like, hey, you know what? Let me, let me drill down here. So she clicked on this metric. And she saw that relative to her peers, she had a lower cost of care and a, and a lower length of stay. And she had never seen it. She didn't know how she ranked. She didn't know how her peers were ranked. And she looked at this and she said, you know what, I know what I do. I know one thing that I do is I triage my patients using a handheld device. Like they come in, I do this quick little procedure with them and it really informs me as to a lot of potential conditions that she's going to have, uh, that the patient may have. And so I don't check them in, potentially, right? It's like she does this little triage. She conducts a quick 10-minute routine exam, routine for her, and then it keeps the patient out. And she looked at this, and she was like, you know what? No one knows that I do this, so I'd like to share this with other people. And she looked at me, and she said, Camilo, can I share? And at the time, I was conducting a user interview, which is like, it's like this design process where we sit down with folks and we go, okay, if you'd like to see your data, what would you do? And then they navigate, and you're not allowed to answer questions. All I can do is ask questions, and then the user's supposed to figure it out. And if they can't figure out how to do it, then we go back and we, go and we look at, okay, well, how can we change the software so they can see it? Does that make sense? So, um, so she looked at me, she's like, can I share it? And I just like, you know, can't say anything. And then she goes, oh, yeah, there's the share button. So she went on share, and she was like, well, what if I wanted to send this to all of the nurse practitioners on the floor? Can I do that? And then she said, and you know, Dr. So-and-so, I want to send it to Dr. Tamimi, right? We got personalized avatar. Uh, and then she wrote this, you know, and then she shared it with a, a couple of folks. But then she, she left this on the discussion and she said, hey folks, this would be a perfect methodology to assess the metrics of cost effectiveness. Uh, <laughs> And that was pretty cool. Two people agreed, one of which was Dr. Tamimi. Um, and so we have been building this platform for the net last number of months. We're wrapping up uh, the pilot here November 7th. And then we're going to do a major, all of our team has been really focused on Mayo. We've been coming out here. Um, we're going to take a step back. We're going to work with Lee. We're going to work with the network members here and say, OK, so who has the appetite for being involved on something like this on a national scale? Because we're really serious about revolutionizing healthcare. The way you do it is by giving people information and giving them a place to have that conversation, and it's social media. So thanks for the chance to share this with you guys, and look forward to hearing more from me. And if you get any questions, please don't hesitate to approach me and ask. Thanks. Thanks, Camilo. Uh, next, we'd like to invite up Bob West. And uh, Bob uh, did a a great job pinch hitting yesterday uh, for um, Phil Ballman, who was uh, originally scheduled to, to speak. And he, uh, we asked him to be provocative, and he uh, exceeded expectations, let's just put it that way. And so we asked him to do a condensed version of it uh, for today. So thanks, Bob. Okay, so what I did, uh, it was a roughly 55-minute talk yesterday, and I tried to pare it down to... 15. Uh, we'll see how well it works. It doesn't mean I'm going to talk fast. I'm not. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, provocative title. The emperor has no clothes. It came from a uh, conversation on Twitter that I had with uh, Kelly Young, who's a part of the EAB. Not here today, but um, we talk a lot about health care. And si similar to Camille, um, I think I have the same passion he does. I noticed it at the end, he's a very passionate individual. Uh, I think that's what you really need um, to change healthcare for the better. And uh, Kelly has that, I have that, and, and uh, Kelly and I talk a lot. And, um, and so the emperor has no clothes. That came from, um, we're talking about healthcare and how uh, it, it's uh, not the way it needs to be. A lot of patients are, are unhappy. And as it says on the top line there, are doctors really well trained? If so, why did they complain so much? 
I'm going to give you my answer to uh, are they really well trained. It's no offense to doctors. It's not th their fault. And then we'll cover some of the points below in the red box as we go. I've stripped this down a bit. Um, we're talking about two main points. But the, f the final bottom line is that uh, the medical establishment gets to uh, needs to go to what uh, Lee Hood, uh, an MD at the Institute of Sin Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington, calls P4 medicine. I'll define that in a moment. And in my opinion, social media is the conduit to P4 medicine. So um, I've been teaching medical students for 30 years, and I haven't been teaching them this, what's shown up here on the slide, and in fact, that is my exact point. What is shown on this slide uh, is, is taught in my medical elective, uh, has been for the past five years, and really it needs to be core material. There have been two major revolutions that have occurred within the past 15 years or so, and they're shown at the poles of this network map. The first is the Human Genome Project, and the second is the internet. The internet has given rise to uh, social media. And so everything in the big blue box in the bottom is somewhat related to the internet, and, uh, and certainly social media is a huge amplification of that. And then everything on the top box is related to genomics. So my background is in genomics. I'm trained as a molecular biologist, and so I am qualified to teach this information. And um, my goal, when the, the web came along and I saw, and, and uh, human genome information was being published online, was to say, was to actually first see it and then say, you know, medical students should be should be getting this in a much bigger way than they are. To be honest with you, uh, most medical schools, most medical students are still trained as the same way their mentors were back in the 20th century. They, medical schools have not kept pace uh, with either of these two revolutions shown here. You heard a little bit about uh, that on the bottom in terms of the social revolution from Dr. V this morning. Um, so anyhow, I teach this as a medical elective. Um, I get all my information from Twitter. Uh, I'm there 99% uh, for social media. And, um, and I knew in order to teach a course that, that uh, expected the medical students to know all of the components of this network map that I needed to know it myself and I had to keep up with all these. So consequently, I'm on Twitter 24-7, 365, and you'll see me tweeting to all of the various topics you see up there. That can be a lot to handle if you're following me. Uh, a lot of people would not want to follow me on Twitter because I, I tweet hard science and I teach social uh, sociology and uh, healthcare social media. So at any rate, um, I'm not the only one who's done this. I'm going to talk about uh, three other key leaders, Francis Collins an MD, PhD, who's the director of NIH, everybody should know him. And he proclaims uh, the same thing, that we need to undergo a shift. Uh, he would back up anything that I say here today, I'm sure. And Lee Hood, absolutely he would. Uh, I came close to mentoring, uh, having him as a postdoctoral mentor. I didn't, but um, I know him. And, uh, and so he's the one that coined the term P4 medicine for predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. And that's the best way to describe it, really, in a nutshell. Predictive, because our genes will predict our uh, future health liabilities. Preventative, because you can take measures to overcome the predicted health liabilities. Personalized, because we all have unique genetic variations that are going to affect our health. And participatory, because, well, here's a doctor, and he's saying, you know, the best way to do medicine is to be a partner with your patient. Unfortunately, today's healthcare is not set up like that. It's, it's the old-fashioned paternalistic model that patients hate and doesn't work well uh, in anybody's opinion that I know of. So, um, forward. And so the third doctor I wanted to mention was uh, Eric Topol. He's more of a late arrival on the scene. He tweets a lot. His Twitter handle is shown there. He wrote that book, Creative Destruction of Medicine. He has a Twitter hashtag for it called uh, hashtag CDOM for the acronym of the title of the book. 
And he put this, uh, he's in the media a lot, you, you, uh, many have seen him. So he quotes from Voltaire, doctors prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less, and human beings of which they know nothing. And you know, he's absolutely right. It's the same way today. Um, we still, uh, doctors don't know enough to really practice medicine satisfactorily in many cases. I'm not saying in all cases, certainly in a case that Dr. V mentioned this morning with respect to the child at eight magnets, there's an example where this obviously wouldn't apply. So, um, um, so it depends upon the circumstance. So the questions that I raise in the outline for my uh, one hour talk, the first was, are docs really well trained? And my answer to that is, for most, no. Now, there are some doctors who are extremely well trained. So bear in mind, I'm used to seeing medical students. I, I taught them 30 years. We get 160 a year. That's a lot of medical students over the course of a 30-year career. And I can tell you the top 10 percent are, are outstanding, really the top third. I can also tell you the bottom third are terrible. And, uh, and they're going to go out there and practice in the healthcare system and wreak havoc. And, uh, and that reminds me of the favorite joke, what do you call a student who graduates on the bottom of his, of his class? Oh, right. It's indistinguishable from those who graduate from the top 10%. Top and then uh, my second answer is not enough to deal with today's sophisticated patients. So because of the internet and because of social media, we have well trained patients today, empowered patients. I'm one of them myself. Uh, I can appreciate, uh, you know, concerns. I know patients who are smarter than their physicians because they're online, they're reading the original journal articles and, they're, and their treating doctors are not. They're too busy to do that. That empowers the patient. And unfortunately, in the old model of uh, paternalism, that, that uh, there's a disconnect between doctor and patient. And um, so I'm going to give you five reasons why doctors are not really well trained in general. And the first is the human body is too complex to know. And I should have put in quotation, in uh, parentheses there, today. Um, it's human body, you know, so, so the example I gave yesterday is as a graduate student and as a uh, postdoc and as a faculty member, I worked with three model organisms, bacteria, yeast, and fruit flies. And to make, to do an experiment with any of those model organisms and to draw a conclusion is so difficult. And to have it make any sense in terms of an experimental prediction and experimental outcome. And yet here, we're, we're uh, medical science is using humans uh, to do experiments when they do drug studies. And uh, it's almost impossible to interpret most of them. And second, uh, there's insufficient information on diseases. There's so little we know and we're spoiled because technology has so superseded everything that we've achieved uh, in terms of understanding a human biology. And we're, we've gotten used to uh, advances and you got to understand medical science has not kept pace with technology and uh, it seems like we're in the dark ages here in medical science and in fact we we are we really are and then third diagnosis is an art not a science and that's going to bring up a term when you say science it's going to bring up a term that's uh, that uh, is fashionable today in medical circles EBM or evidence-based medicine and, um, and, and consequently, there's an overemphasis and misunderstanding of EBM. And, um, and on top of that, side by side, there's insufficient appreciation of genomics and personalized medicine. So I'm going to concentrate on points four and five there, and I'm going to go through them systematically in terms of uh, how doctors today are not prepared to practice in the 21st century. So um, I'll give you a personal a anecdote for EBM in a moment, but it stands for evidence-based medicine. It replaces anecdotal medicine, which is a good idea, because anecdotal is just, I tried this as a physician, this didn't work, so I'm going to try this, or my friend said this treatment 
worked for his patient, so I'll try it for my patient. Evidence-based medicine was founded on a great principle. You know, rather than f uh, call up your buddy and find out what worked for his patient, you're actually going to go by clinical studies that were performed scientifically and came to a firm conclusion based upon a large body of patients in a very unbiased manner. And that's what the pyramid shows here. Um, I mean, you can read it word for word. I'm not going to take the time to do that. But there's a problem with that, a huge problem. And I give you four different ways that evidence-based medicine is problematic. The first is based on population studies, population averaging. So imagine us in this room going and, and being part of a clinical study uh, for some drug treatment. And none of us is related. We're all genetically extremely different, very heterogeneous. Our bodies are going to react very, very differently with that particular treatment. And on top of that, we've been exposed to various environmental differences over the course of our lifetimes. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take us and you're going to take the treatment, average the results, and say, we'll take the average and treat everybody here based upon the average of all of us in this room. How does that work? You could never run science the way it ordinarily runs in scientific laboratories on that principle. So it, to start, it doesn't even make sense. Um, second, research itself is inherently unreliable. So there's this Greek guy, Ioannidis, who, um, who was very low key back in uh, the mid 2000s and he wrote this PLOS medicine paper called Why the Majority of Medical Science is Wrong. And as soon as I saw the title, I knew he was dead on because I, you know, science has phonies too. It's not just, um, it's not just medical doctors. It's, I mean, it's rife in any field. And um, so he uh, exposed the truth, and he's since been hired at Stanford University to head up all of their clinical trial studies at Stanford University. I mean, that's, that's an acknowledgment that everything he said in that paper and has published since is dead on, that uh, you can't trust published research. But published research is what makes up EBM, and doctors are being trained in EBM based on that public published research, which is wrong, right? So how does that work? And then relied, it's relied heavily on pharma funding where there's been many instances of conflicts of interest by pharma. So when pharma funds a study and they funded lots and lots, uh, there's been a lot of cheating going on. You know, I hate to use the word C, the C word, but uh, that in fact is what it is, and, uh, and I'm calling them out on it. And, um, and so you can't trust a lot of that research that was pharma funded where those conflicts of interest were known to be in place. And then fourthly, patient values and expectations are often ignored. So what's shown on the bottom figure is a triad of uh, understanding on how evidence-based medicine should work based upon a doctor's individual clinical expertise best external scientific evidence and the patient's values and expectations. But most doctors I've met ignore the patient's goals and they practice based on their clinical experience and EBM. And I, you know, it's insanity. I, it's hard to imagine that that's the way things are happening. So I go back to the original question that I posed. Um, are, pa are doctors really well trained? Um, if so, why are patients unhappy? And I think uh, this underlies at least some of it. So uh, giving a personal anecdote of EBM, I was treated by a doctor as an asthmatic with a series of uh, drugs, inhaled drugs, some of which are glucocorticoids, and they're underscored in red here. And each time I was given the glucocorticoid inhalant to uh, to, to try to remedy my asthma, uh, it would suffocate me. And then um, I didn't have this list in the early days like it's indicated here. This is the exact piece of paper shown that I, I take to physicians, uh, allergists now. And um, 
but I would take it to the second doctor. He said, well, you know, maybe it was the, a problem with that particular glucocorticoid, so we'd try another and it would suffocate me. It's supposed to have the opposite effect. No drug is supposed to suffocate you. By the time I got to this doctor down here, not that long ago, a few years ago, I, had, I gave him this list and I said, these suffocate me. And he said, no, no, this one is different, Alvesco. I've, I'm protecting the reputation of the doctors here. And, um, and it, it suffocated me. And he, I was supposed to do two puffs a day, so I cut it to one so I wouldn't suffocate. And then I had a follow-up appointment, and I stuck with him for a year or so, maybe two years. And f by, by the, uh, the end of that session, um, I went back and I told him, uh, you know, I cut it to one, and he said, no, double the dose, double the suffocation dose. And really, in my discussions with him, he's uh, working based on evidence-based medicine. So I had no choice but to fire this particular doctor because I didn't want to suffocate. And I mean, what are you gonna, I could not talk to him and convince him that this was actually detrimental to my health. And by the way, these drugs have killed patients. It's, um, it's not a funny, it, it's much more serious than it might seem at first. And then I knew in the literature with a molecular biology background that there were variants described that affected the way that uh, glucocorticoids were um, uh, absorbed by different patients in terms of uh, their effects on treatment. And in this particular paper, and there's more than this, there's several, a functional variant of this particular gene is associated with substantial decrements in the response to inhaled glucocorticoids in patients with asthma. So the docs are supposed to keep up with the literature. They're not, they, they should, if a patient knows something, they should take that into consideration. They should not ignore that. So I've been spending a lot of time with two patients here today, migraine, uh, uh, Ellen Schnockenberg and Terry Robert, and, um, and they're both as aware of, you know, what's available for migraine as, uh, as I am for asthma. So, I mean, this is nothing special to me. Any, uh, any patient can do this, and, and they are. Okay, this brings me to the second point, which was the insufficient appreciation of genomics and personalized medicine. So I'm gonna switch to a different model disease here, which is simpler to describe this, and that's rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, I mentioned Kelly Young at the beginning of this talk and, um, and that w we talked a lot and she asked me uh, a couple years ago to write a guest post on RA genetics and I did. I wrote a three part series and I used myself as an example and uh, I went by my 23andMe data and, um, and as you can see by the green bars going down, I have a decreased risk for RA but presumably an RA patient who takes the same test would have red bars going up instead of green bars going down. They will. I, uh, I did a follow-up uh, blog post on my own blog, which is shown here. It's entitled Personalized Medicine 101, and that's also the name of my uh, medical elective. And um, it's, uh, it's detailed. It's 16 pages, single space uh, when printed. And it goes into detail why genomics and personalized medicine can be used to stratify patients for the purpose of diagnosis and prognosis and treatment. It makes a good argument. And since I put this out, uh, a couple of papers have been published to the same effect. And, um, and one of my major points uh, to try to drive home this whole personalized medicine story is we're working in such an outdated uh, medical ages, dark, dark ages. Uh, you know, uh, it, 70 years from now, people will not believe how little we knew about disease back now. And, uh, and I might shock you to say, and other, pe other people, that uh, there's no such thing as rheumatoid arthritis. And um, it's true, that term is a figment of somebody's imagination, and it's, it's uh, one size fits all description in order to try to simplify. It's the lumper splitter argument. So this is lumping people together when in fact for good healthcare you need to be a splitter 
uh, in, in many instances, if not in most. And um, so an important point with regard to there is no such thing as rheumatoid arthritis is that my response to Dana Simon's uh, a post she put up on her own blog called it At the Water's Edge. And my t the blog post was my take on RA treatments and decisions. And I just want to read what I said there. It's, it's posted in the center. Uh, if you really want to start sunny like me, you would say there is no such thing as RA, but a spectrum of autoimmune diseases that overlap genetically and physiologically to varying degrees. Since this concept is not well established in the medical textbooks, there can be no sensible textbook criteria for RA diagnosis. Likewise, there can be no sensible approach to treating those with this spectrum of disorders. This leads to frustration on the part of docs as well as patients. Until this problem is addressed, there will be problems. And uh, that's in, uh, an explanation for that is given here. So this is a paper that came out a couple years ago. And um, what it does is it shows the genes that have been shown to be affiliated with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and systemic sclerosis. And you see that there are, for, for each disease, there are genes that are specific for that specific disease. And then there are genes where they're, they're shared between. And, and in some cases, all three diseases share a specific cluster of genes, like HLA up here is a big one. And, uh, and this is just three circles. There's many more autoimmune diseases than three. There may be as many as 200 that could be named. So you can imagine 200 overlapping circles, and each patient has a, a unique combination of these genes that overlaps with these other diseases. So how do you treat, how do you call a person, well, this person has rheumatoid arthritis. Are you sure they don't have a hybrid rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, et cetera, et cetera? So, I think you can see where that's going, and it's summed up in, in Barabasi's Human Disease Network uh, picture here, where he's showing interconnection between lots of diseases, uh, some which are seemingly unrelated, uh, but really are uh, sharing genes with one another, and thus the treatments for, for those specific patients with those diseases is, uh, has got to be very uh, unique. So the bottom line here is one size fits all medicine will not be valued in a genomic age, even though this is not currently taught as part of the core medical curriculum. And uh, a lot of it summed up here, what I'm trying to say is uh, because the right medical infrastructure was not there, patients, consumers began taking charge of their own health care. They do that through social media. This in turn has created a communication divide between docs and patients who are practicing healthcare in different dimensions from one another, and that this divide is perpetuated in medical schools who have yet adapted to uh, the change they need. This is the emperor with no clothes. The, the medical establishment, including medical schools, are the emperor with no clothes. They're not paying attention. They're in their own silo. Um, and so this is not, an, it is not a, a patients versus doctors situation. It's P4 medicine we're talking about here. Patients don't want to be antagonistic to doctors. They want good treatment, and they want to be uh, a facilitator of treatment by their doctors. So in uh, summary, social media, in my opinion, is the conduit to P4 medicine. So that's uh, my talk. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Cynthia? All right. Um, thank you, guys. So uh, when Lee asked me to join you and think of something um, short and rapid fire to tell you about, I immediately thought of a case study that I'd been thinking about writing about for the blog and hadn't gotten around to it. Maybe I'll still do that. Um, it's a post at the intersection of hate and gratitude is what I call this. But um, it was a post of, from a mother named Monique Mitchell about her daughter, Anjoy Michaela. And Anjoy Michaela was a uh, baby who was born with congenital heart defect. Um, she lived about six months, uh, most of that time in our hospital, in our neonatal intensive care unit. Um, she was released just about a week before she died and was able to be out of the hospital for that week. Um, I didn't know all this uh, on this particular day when I came to work. It was a typically typical day um, in the office. I had several meetings. 
Um, things seem to be pretty quiet on our social media properties. We um, have some uh, alerts that come into our email boxes that alert us when we have new posts and new comments on our Facebook page. And earlier in the day, it had been pretty typical traffic. You know, we'd get a couple of emails, a new post, maybe three new comments, a new post, maybe five new comments. Um, most of those posts were ours. I came out of a meeting in the afternoon and there was a new post and something like 75 new comments and another hyper alert that said 80 new comments and another hyper alert that said 60 some new comments. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I went over to the um, Facebook page and this is what I found. In a post um, to the Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt Facebook page, uh, this photo of Anjoy Michaela with her date of birth and her date of death the words my angel at the bottom, and a note from her mother that says, I just want to thank everyone from the room service people to the surgeons. I just want to say Anjoy fought a good fight. She was born there. Everyone was so wonderful and went above and beyond. She was released 314 for the first time and got to experience the world for only a week. Again, thank you from the journey of Anjoy and the Mitchell's family. So over the next week, we had a roller coaster of comments on this post. Um, as you, you may probably can't see the numbers there, but by the time um, this finished circulating, um, over 205,000, almost 206,000 people had liked it. It had been shared 1,001 times, and there were 3,758 comments on this post. Now, this post is on our page. I know that most people commenting on it were seeing it at their news feed, and they probably didn't think of it as being on the Children's Hospital page, but it was. So we... Um, we looked and we watched some of these things and a lot of the comments were like the ones you see here. What a little angel, Jesus is rocking her now. Rest in peace, sweet baby. What a beautiful child, that's a beautiful angel. Sorry for your loss, poor baby, RIP. So we were kind of keeping a, a rough eye on this but every time we'd open our email again, 60 new comments, 50 new comments, 80 new comments, it was coming in fast and furious. So over the weekend, I happened to be the person on call. I curled up on my sofa with my laptop and my cats and probably had a crappy Lifetime movie going on TV. I'm not sure. And I thought, okay, I'm going to you know, scroll through these. Maybe I ought to pay. Something told me I need to pay a little bit closer attention than what I had been to the comments. So I'm scrolling through them, and I'm seeing some of these, and I'm, I'm crying. You know, the, the worst were there were a number of posts from people who would say, I don't know you, but I've lost a child. And I want to tell you, it'll never be the same again, but you will heal. You will get better. And I'm boohooing. Then I see it. F.U. Michael blank. I won't say his last name. I'm like, where'd that come from? And another one. Go to hell, Michael. There's a special place in hell for you, Michael. I'm like, what is this? What is going on? So I start um, furiously scrolling through, trying to find Michael's post. And then I find it. It says, die in baby die. I have to tell you, at that moment, I must have felt like, I think of taking care of a community, taking care of our Facebook community like a shepherd with, with his or her flock, and it must have been the adrenaline that a shepherd feels when they notice the mountain lion or the wolf on the outside of their, their flock. I was furious. I, it, he is not going to do this on my page. So I deleted his comment, and, of course, the community had come to the defense of this woman, but the language that they were using because they were so enraged was not allowable on the page either. Um, now, we had commented early in the process to Michaela's mom, just thanking her for sharing her story and expressing our condolences. Um, but I kept thinking, gosh, is she coming back here and reading this? You know, I don't want her to see these kinds of, of comments. So we were deleting them as fast as we could. And then it would die down for a little while. And I posted at one point um, just a, a reminder about our participation guidelines. Um, we had posted earlier in the conversation um, how much I had, how much we'd been moved by the outpouring of support and love to this family. Um, this happened three times during the course of that week. There were there were two other racially charged um, um, comments that were posted on this. That um, again, we saw a big spike and and um, had to go in and delete. And at one point, I was concerned because there were so many posts. I wasn't sure that I had caught all of them. So I also posted, um, you know so touched by the outpouring of love and support, also dismayed by some of the ugly comments, uh, few ugly comments that have been posted 
it, we're trying to delete those, but if you happen to see one that we've missed, please private message us because we just wanted desperately to catch all of those. Um, I've been in contact with, um, with uh, Monique Mitchell since. Um, it's been um, just passed on Joy's first birthday, and they had a big birthday party and posted on the Facebook page about that. And I just noticed this morning that she had posted that they're planning to bring toys to the children at Children's Hospital over Christmas time because they remember what it was like being at the hospital over Christmas. Um, I use this example a lot with our clinicians because um, I want them to understand two things. One is that our patients and our families are on social media. And the other is that customer service and doing the right thing by our families has never been more important. I mean, this was a busy weekend moderating 3,700 comments, but this is a bittersweet situation. She, she lost her baby, and I'm heartbroken about that, but she was, under the circumstances, um, pleased with the care that we gave. But if she had not been, if she had held us responsible for the death of that child in some way, we would have been in major crisis mode that weekend. So I tell all of our clinicians, I use this example and tell them about Enjoy, and I remind them that customer service has never been more important and that every encounter with a patient or family should be Facebook worthy. So anyway, I hope um, one of the other lessons that we learned, I will share, just kind of um, deconstructing this, why did it go so viral? Among some of the, the inferences we made were that um, this was right after Facebook had changed its functionality so that more people would see comments, so it was a little bit more open. So I think a lot of people, it was starting to spread outside of um, Monique Mitchell's own network. Um, also, I think the magic, if you will, of that, that photograph, that image, it told the story. You saw it and you immediately knew that this little baby had had a very short life and had passed away. And so you knew the story immediately of this mother's loss. And then the other thing um, I think was just human nature. Because people were so moved by the loss of this child, just liking the post gave them something to feel like they had done something. So anyway, we've learned a lot from this situation. Um, I, I think of Monique a lot. I think of Anjoy a lot. And I just wanted to share it with you guys as well. All right, great. The last, uh, the last section we have, or the last presentation we have is this part uh, is from Reed Smith. Uh, so Reed, if you'd uh, get hooked up. Uh, he has some uh, interesting things around uh, Twitter analytics and, and hospitals to share. Okay, um, so it does say Facebook and, and hospitals, so I didn't, I didn't misspell that, but I thought I'd cover Facebook just very briefly and then, then the Twitter pieces as well. So, um, is this part, is this on? Okay. So, I, you know, I spend a lot of time with hospitals. Sorry. I spend a lot of time with hospitals. And, and what I'm starting to realize is I don't feel like we spend in the appropriate amount of time pressing pause and really looking at what we have done uh, to learn from it. So, we, we all measure who all uses some sort of analytic program to look at Twitter and Facebook and, and things like that. I don't feel like, however, that we really take a second and look at what that looks like over a broader spectrum and how that correlates back to what we do. So I want to go through just a couple things real quick. We started with, with uh, actually Facebook, and this was a little over a year ago. We looked at uh, 13 hospital systems across the country. And, and you can see these are the years that their pages were actually set up. So we had some early adopters in like 08, 09 was kind of a big year, it looks like. But then we had people that had just recently even set up their page. Uh, and I'll tell you, these are acute care hospitals, post-acute, there's some children's hospitals, cancer, so forth and so on. So it was kind of a wide spectrum. And, and we started asking people how much time they spent weekly uh, as an administrator on their Facebook page. And so very quickly we started realizing they either spent a whole lot or, or not very much. There wasn't just a whole bunch in the middle, uh, which we thought was kind of interesting. And then we started looking at, uh, we looked at Facebook updates over a three-month period of time over the summer. And so you'll see down there at the bottom, uh, we looked at about 1,600 updates, which included uh, not quite 9 million impressions, uh, equated to 42,000 engagements and so forth. The, the point here really is not to read all the numbers, but the order of the days of the week were when they were posting. So the most of the updates happened on Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, right? Because that's when you're at work. You know, Monday you're on conference calls all day. 
Friday you're packing it in. So everybody's posting in the middle of the week. The problem is the size of the bubble was where the engagement happened. So the majority of their engagement happened on Monday, Friday, Sunday. And so this was just a learning, this was just for these. I'm not saying this is what it is across the board, but it's just a good opportunity to plot these things out and really spend some time thinking, are we putting our content out when people are actually even going to see it? And so being a little more strategic about how we plan. Um, anybody that posts on, on, on Facebook obviously knows there's several different types of posts you can make. So out of those 1,600 or 1,589, uh, over 50% of those were a link. Uh, and then after that, it went to photos. When we flipped and looked then at the engagement, uh, it changed quite a bit. Uh, and this is, you know, everybody kind of knows this now, but we're, you know, we're starting to realize that people do not like to leave Facebook once they're inside of Facebook. So just posting links out to other uh, pieces of content, um, while if it's engaging enough, people will still do it, it's important to think about how can we keep them inside of the platform and keep them engaged. Uh, the type of post, um, it's been a little while since we've done this, and, and I'll tell you this was uh, by far the hardest thing to do because there's no easy way to do this. So we got an intern to do it, but no, I'm kidding, <laughs> kind of. Um, so I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember exactly what, like for instance, the difference between general and information. But the point is, it, most everything that was being posted had to do with an event, uh, some sort of informative piece. The one that I thought was really interesting was there was not a bit more posted about hospital-based services, which is that one on the far right. I thought that would have been much higher. Uh, but then again, personal story was the lowest. And then if we looked at the engagement, of course, personal story is the highest. And so again, we, we know these things, but are we going back to look at actually what we're doing and are we actually practicing what we preach and what we know to be true? So then we started looking at Twitter a little bit and, and literally I just got this data this week and um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my good friends at W2O Group, Greg Matthews helped me uh, consolidate some of this content. So. We've just started looking at this, and I, you know, there's different insights to be seen, but I thought it was worth kind of throwing up here and seeing what you guys think. Uh, we started with just Texas with the uh, size of hospitals uh, and their Twitter accounts. And so the numbers across the bottom are actually the uh, bed count. So you can see the majority of the Twitter accounts in the state of Texas relative to hospitals are in that 100 to 300 bed hospital. So sole community providers, smaller communities, things like that. And I think what this says is, is they have an opportunity within their communities. You know, obviously there are less hospitals, obviously, with a, over a thousand beds, but we have a lot of accounts out there and a lot of people with a lot of voice um, in those sole community providers. Uh, these are hospitals online by state, and so this was based off of uh, uh, the hospital networking list, uh, and then we did add in some more for Texas, so that's why it's so much darker than everybody else. But again, the bigger states obviously have more people online, California, Florida, Texas, uh, and then up in the Northeast. Average tweets per day, I, I'm not sure what's happening in Rhode Island, but they are tweeting like crazy. I don't know. What's that? It's, I, is that what it is? It's almost, it's over five and a half tweets a day coming out of Rhode Island. But anyway, so, uh, and this is some you know, normalized data. So uh, then we started looking topically speaking. So this is joint replacement just over the last year. And so you can see some big fluxes going up and down. And so topically what was being said relative to joint replacement. And the number one joint replacement tweet over the past year was a Mayo Clinic tweet. So there you go. So you win, you win the joint replacement category for, for this past year. Uh, and then here's the heat map relative to that. I thought it was really interesting that there's this big gap in the south where apparently they just don't talk about joint replacement. I, I don't know why that is. Uh, yeah, there's am amputations. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, and, I don't, and I don't know why New Mexico is so high. So anyway, it's just kind of interesting to look at. Uh, this is weight loss surgery. So huge spike right at the end of January. Uh, one thing that I just thought was interesting by looking at this, because we, we work with a lot of acute care hospitals that, that uh, bariatrics or, joint, uh, or uh, weight loss surgery is a big deal for them. And they always try to push it towards the end of the year because everybody's met their deductible at that point. In a lot of cases, this is a, an elective procedure. So, but no one's talking about it then. 
So anyway, it's just kind of interesting to see, does this align with what your growth strategies are and how you're communicating? Uh, number one, Mayo Clinic again. More common types of weight loss surgery. Uh, and then here's the weight loss surgery uh, heat map. Um, real big in Louisiana and South Carolina, apparently. Uh, urgent care, this is another one that I thought would have been uh, probably, you see some spikes there as the summer starts, and that's probably the, now that you're out of school and your kid breaks his arm tweets and things like that. Um, but I thought it would been a little bit higher through the summer months. Yeah. Can one really aggressively busy hospital skew those results? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they can, absolutely. Um, and Cleveland Clinic actually had the highest um, uh, or the most popular tweet relative to urgent care. And so here's the urgent care discussions. Again, kind of interesting. Surgery. So surgery is a pretty broad category, so you see the numbers kind of go up a little bit. Number one, Cleveland Clinic again, uh, mentioning a couple of, uh, uh, those are NBA players, right? Lee? Yeah. Isn't that right? So tons of retweets because number one, they have a huge audience and they're mentioning athletes. Uh, there's hospitals discussing surgery. So it's a little more, a little more widespread. Uh, of course, big, big in the Northeast. Uh, South Carolina again, apparently. Uh, and then cancer. So cancer is a pretty broad topic, and, and I thought this was interesting. So most of those top tweets uh, got retweeted on average somewhere. I think the lowest one was maybe eight times, and the biggest one had been retweeted maybe 20 or 25 times. Cancer, however, you know, much higher volume. The number one tweet was from Nationwide Kids. And, and who saw the, the video of the, uh, the little kid, Ohio State, scrimmage, and he ran down the field, and the team ran with him, and he scored and, and the whole deal. So Sports Center sent this out, and they retweeted it. This actually got retweeted uh, 29,833 times. So the disparity between you know, some of these topics and others is, is really interesting to look at. Um, and so there's uh, hospitals discussing cancer. And so here are the count of actually those tweets. And so joint replacement, not a whole lot of people. Cancer, there's a whole bunch of people. Um, I, you know, I think it's just, it's, it's interesting to go back and do this in your own organization and really understand is what we're actually talking about aligning with what we're trying to grow, promote, uh, advance. And because I, I'm typically finding that it, it doesn't. Um, you know, social is still... Uh, practiced separate from marketing and communications uh, in most cases and we have to figure out better ways to integrate those because we're not you know we're, we're leaving a lot of equity on the table with a lot of these channels and a lot of these mediums when we're not aligning this with organizational goals so that's what I got thanks